Well, hi, everybody, and welcome back to our weekly Bible study here at King's Revival Church International. My name is Gareth, and uh, I'll be sharing the lesson with you today. And I'm so excited to be with each and every one of you every week um, to spend time with you in the Word of God. Um, that really, really uh, gets me going. And um, what an honor it is to share the Word of God with you. So I want to thank each and every one of you that's joined us today. If it's your first time, well, you are our special guest and uh, we pray that it won't be your first, your your uh, only time after, after this. And I know that you are going to be blessed by the Word of God today. And so today um, I'll be sharing a message that I received while reading the 24th Psalm. And in the middle of the Psalm, David the writer, he recalls the life of Jacob. So he refers to Jacob. And when you look at the life of Jacob, Jacob by no means was a perfect man, but nevertheless, he was blessed by God. He, he received much favor. Um, Jacob is a key figure in the Bible and is known as one of the founding patriarchs of the, the nation of Israel. And the title of my message today is, the Jacob generation, the Jacob generation. And I'm going to share six characteristics of a Jacob generation that I received by, by just by looking at the life of Jacob. So get your Bibles, uh, get your pens, your notebooks, and uh, make sure you take lots of notes and so that you can go over this word and that you can teach this word to other people as well. So Psalm 24 um, let's have a look there. We'll re we won't read the whole psalm. We'll, we'll just read the first six verses in Psalm 24, a psalm of David. Verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Verse 6, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Selah. All right, let's see what we can get from each verse. Verses 1 to 5 will, will kind of be my introduction. And then verse 6, we'll get the, the six characteristics um, of a Jacob generation. So verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. And I think this is such an important um, verse because um, some Christians who don't have this revelation, give in and give up when they face adversity. And they tend to see themselves as a victim. Right? So you cannot be a Christian and a victim at the same time. Right? Um, so uh, we are not dualists in the sense that we don't believe that, that, you know, we have God and we have Satan and they're equal in power. The one is evil, the one is good. And then there's like a, a, a battle between them uh, to see who's, who's going to come out on top. No, it's, it's nothing like that at all, right? There is only one supreme Lord over all the world, and that is God the Father. God the Father gives to Jesus all authority in heaven and on earth. And Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, where he's crowned as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Satan's authority, on the other hand, his authority, his power, he does have, but it's limited. And it is subordinate to the authority that is in Christ Jesus. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness, um, he was there fasting 40 days, and then Satan came and he tries to test Jesus. Notice in Luke uh, chapter 4 verse 6, you'll see that when you look at that verse, that Satan is not the ultimate authority in the world because he admits to this. Look what he says. To you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me. 
right? So Satan acknowledges that the, the authority that he has has been given to him. So it's been delivered to him. Well, delivered by whom? Well, God in his sovereignty, he considered it wise as part of his curse on the world after the, the fall of Adam and Eve to give Satan power in this world. But he doesn't have ultimate power. We are not dualists. So, so God and Satan are not equal, right? Um, all Satan's power is by permission. In Luke 22 verse 53, we see Judas, he betrays Jesus. And then the, the chief priests are coming to arrest to arrest Jesus. Well, Jesus says to them, this is your hour and the power of darkness. So Jesus is basically, he says, you get one hour. You get an hour. You get one hour. I know when it starts. I know when it ends. That's your hour. It's all by sovereign permission that you can do your deeds. So where is Satan now? Well, he's under my feet in Jesus name. I have authority over him in the name of Jesus. So we, when we're born again, we might have been a victim. We might have fallen to, to adverse um, circumstances and situations, but we never remain a victim. We, don't, we never have a victim mentality, right? Because we do have power. We do have authority and it comes from Jesus. And uh, Satan has to bow down to the authority of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He is under my feet. He is under my authority. I, I take authority over every demon and every form of evil because Jesus is supreme. He is the God above all. Hallelujah. That is who we serve. And we need that revelation that God owns all, all the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the supreme Lord over all that is in this earth. Amen. And look at verse 2. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the river. So verse 2 really enforces verse 1 because it shows the sovereignty of God. It shows the power, the glory, the majesty and the holiness of, of, of God. And there is none like him. Hallelujah. And the more we focus on God, the more we meditate in his word, the smaller the devil becomes, the weaker he becomes. And, and so the greater your revelation of who the Father is, the more you will realize how limited Satan is. Satan's power is limited and his time is limited. Verse 3, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? So David he asked the question then, if, if God is so holy and, and majestic, then who can stand in his presence? Who of us can experience his glory? How do we get to where he is? And then David, he gives us the answer in the next verse. Look what he says in verse 4. Well, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully so there's a few things there in verse verse four so the first thing david says well if you want to get into his presence number one you need to have clean hands well your hands represent your works the dirty hands speaks of sin clean hands speak of righteousness only through the blood of jesus can our hands be cleansed from sin it's only through the blood Praise God. 1 John 1 verse 7 to 9 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's through the blood of Jesus that our hands are cleansed from sin. You want to get into his presence, you've got to be cleansed from sin. And then he says, you've got to have a pure heart. Well, your heart can only become pure when you're born again. When your sins are forgiven 
and you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior because we need a new heart. We need to become a new creature, the Bible says. So who gives you the new heart? Well, it's God. It's a supernatural work. It's a miracle that takes place. Ezekiel 11 verse 19. I love the scripture. It says, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. This is a work of God. Look at how James says the same thing that David does. He makes a connection between our hands and our hearts. In James 4, 8, it says, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you, but cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Hallelujah. So David is teaching us how to get into his presence. He goes in and says, the one who does not lift up his soul to what is false. Well, what does that talk about? It talks about idols. It talks about putting things above God. It's talking about being, uh, uh, you know, getting caught up in the things of the world, in, in material things. And, 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 and so... Once again, in, in Ezekiel 36, verse 25 to 27, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your unclean, uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put in you. So we see there that, that um, we've, we've got to be careful of the things of the world the the you know the lust of the flesh and, and of the eyes and what we see um, and so David says if you want to get into the presence of God well you need clean hands you need a clean heart and you need to keep yourself from lifting your soul to what is false and then he goes and, and he says and then the person who does not swear deceitfully well the He's saying that you've got to be true to your word, that you don't lie. The one who has integrity. In other words, the person who loves the truth. That's what he's talking about. We've got to be sincere men and women of God. A, a, a person seeking after the true and the real and not running after shadows and, and falsehood. A man true to God and to his neighbor. That's what it means not to swear deceitfully. And you know, I want to, I want to add that um, you know, we're reading from the Old Testament and it's not the law does not get you into his presence. Right. It's not about doing a list of things and then and then I'm in his presence. No, it's about positioning yourself. You have to position yourself to get into his presence. Right. Um, when it comes to covenant theology, the old covenant says you must achieve. You must achieve. If you want, you've got to achieve. But the new covenant says, no, you must just receive. It's a, you see, there's a state of rest. We, we need to get a place to, to a place of rest and receiving. That's what it's about. The blessing was given to Adam to tend, but the curse made him to toil. We are no longer under the curse. Hallelujah. We are under grace and the work at the cross is a finished work. Amen. Jesus said it is done. It is finished. Praise God. So then in verse five, David goes on to say, he, so, so, so those with clean hands, clean heart, clean, clean heart um, doesn't lift up his soul to, to, to idols and to the world um, who is not deceitful. Well, he, that person will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. He will receive blessing from the Lord. Not too long ago, I preached a message on the prayer of Jabez. And I mentioned that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, by faith, we are blessed. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Hallelujah. Our blessing is in Jesus Christ. Can you see how David is saying the same thing in verse 5? He talks about blessing. He talks about righteousness and salvation in one sentence. You see, Jesus 
is our blessing. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our salvation. Hallelujah. You cannot earn these things. You can only believe for these things. Abiding in Christ means abiding in the heavenly places and in all the spiritual blessings God has given to us in Him. Hallelujah. So that's my introduction. Verse 6. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Selah. Now the New King James Version says it like this. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face. So it talks about a Jacob generation. He refers to a Jacob generation. Hallelujah. I believe that we need a Jacob generation in this time. I believe that the Father is looking for a type for a Jacob generation. Well, who is a Jacob generation? Well, I'm going to share with you six characteristics of a Jacob generation that I, that I just received through looking at the life of Jacob. Number one, a Jacob generation is a people that seek God more than anything else. They seek God more than anything else. So we've got to look at the life of Jacob, right? So turn with me to Genesis 32. And we'll read just a few verses there. But just to pl place this in context, and I know you, you know this, you know what happened here. We see Esau, his brother, is, is, is on his way to kill Jacob because of what Jacob had done in, in to him in his past. Uh, Jacob, because of his trickery and his deception, he stole his brother's birthright um, and he was on his way with a few hundred men to come and, 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 and to kill, to kill his brother Jacob, to, to, to take revenge on, on, on what he had done. And so we find Jacob is in a desperate situation. He was desperate and in his desperation, he would seek God's face. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We've got to become a people that is hungry, a people that is desperate for the presence of God. We've got to, to run after his face. We've got to seek his presence. Above all, above everything else, we need to put him first. This is a Jacob generation. Jacob was at his end. Jacob didn't know what to do. He was, de he was desperate. And in his desperation, he ran to the Father. He ran to his God. Where do you run to in your desperation? Where do you go in the, when you don't know what to do? What do you do? Well, let's learn from Jacob. Jacob um, ran to his God. Hallelujah. He ran to his Father. Praise the Lord. And we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, that is the God that we serve. And so number one, a Jacob generation is a people that will seek God more than anything else. Number two, a Jacob generation is a people who have an encounter with the living God. Who have an encounter with the living God. Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 32 and verse 24. It reads, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. So yeah, we see that when Jacob was alone, that he wrestled with an angel and, and, and some commentators say that this was, the, 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 this was Jesus. He was wrestling with, with the angel of the covenant, which is Jesus. And so my point that I want to make here is that God reveals himself to the hungry. God reveals himself to the desperate. He reveals himself to the ones that diligently seek him. Those are the ones, those are the people that will have an encounter. You see, Jacob had an encounter. He had a face, the Bible says, he had a face-to-face -face encounter with the living God. He had a he had an encounter with Jesus, right? So um, 
You will not have an encounter with God unless you seek Him. You see, you have to seek Him. In the beginning of verse 24, it says, Jacob was left alone. Jacob was left alone. You see, there's a time where you need to put aside where it's just you and the Father, where there's just you and the Holy Spirit, where it's just you and Him alone in prayer. It's time alone. You put that time aside. If you want an encounter with the living God, well, you've got, to, you've got to be desperate. You've got to be hungry. You've got to seek Him. And you've got to put that time aside. When it, sometimes it means that you've got to fast and pray for three days, seven days, 21 days, 40 days, whatever it is. If you are hungry, if you are desperate, if you want to have an encounter with the living God, you've got to put time aside to seek His face. Hallelujah. The Jacob generation is a people who will have an encounter with the living God because of their persistence, because they seek Him. In Hosea chapter 12 verse 4, Hosea is referring to when um, Jacob was wrestling with the angel. And he shows us how Jacob was wrestling. Well, it says here in in Hosea 12 4, Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor with him. He found him in Bethel and there he spoke to us. Hallelujah. You see, how was Jacob wrestling? How was Jacob, what was he doing? Well, he he was weeping um, and he was was prevailing and he was struggling. So today we don't don't fight um, like a a physical battle, but we, we pray, we intercede. This is the attitude. This is the kind of prayer that, that, that was, that was um, evident in, 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 in Jacob's life. And so we need to be a, a, a people that will, that will uh, you know, the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man will availeth much. What kind of prayers are you praying? Well, how, how are you praying? Are you, are you weeping before the Lord? Well, you want an encounter? You, you want to have an encounter? You've got to cry out to Him. Come on. You've got to wrestle in prayer. You've got to intercede. You've got to fight. You've got to get on your knees. You've got to get in prayer. That is how we're, we, we're touched by Him. That is how we will have an encounter with Him. Praise God. And the Lord says in Jeremiah 29 verse 13, the Lord says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You see, not just with some of your heart, not with just with a, a bit of your heart. No, with your whole heart. It's a whole, you put your whole heart into it. You put all your time, all your energy, all your effort. You commit it 100% and it's, it's all or nothing. Come on, that's the attitude Jacob had. He knew that if, if God didn't come through for him then, that would be the end of his life he was desperate he was hungry and he sought his face he wrestled he prevailed number three a Jacob generation is one who seeks the Lord no matter the cost he seeks the Lord no matter the cost look at Genesis 32 verse 25 now when he saw that he did not prevail against him he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him and he said let me go for the day breaks so imagine that even though Jacob's hip was out of joint he still continued to fight. It doesn't say that he stopped fighting when, he's, when, 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 the, when his hip was out of joint. You know, Jacob must have been an excruciating pain, fighting against an angel, yet he continued. The pain didn't make him stop. Hallelujah. The pain didn't make him stop. He continued to wrestle with his angel. And you know, when you wrestle the 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 hip the you you lean your whole weight is on is is on your your legs and you you're moving and you're positioning yourself and you're using your weight now he's he's holding on he's in pain he can't wrestle like he was but he 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 just keeps going he just keeps going he's relentless we need a jacob generation not a perfect people jacob was far from perfect He didn't have it all together, but he sought the Lord. He sought, you know, that's one thing that we can't take away from anyone. You might have mistakes. You might be full of weaknesses. You might might have a bad past. You might have messed up greatly. But you know what? 
the fact that you get to God, despite that, the, 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 despite how many times you fall and you still get to God, that, that, that says a lot to me. Yes, we need to repent and change and, and not do. But the fact that you keep going to God and you keep going to God in, in true repentance, in, in humbleness, in brokenness, you, the key is to get to Him. And in His presence, He changes us. God is looking for a generation that will rise up, that will never give up, despite the obstacles, despite the challenges, despite the setbacks and the pain, and, and will continue to preach the gospel, come on, to win souls, to make disciples, and, they, and, and never give up. That's the Jacob generation. He's not looking for a perfect people. He's looking for a hungry people. He's looking for a desperate people. He's looking for the person that lives by faith. He's looking for the person that has great faith, that will believe, that will believe in a great God despite their weaknesses and their, and their shortcomings. Number four, a Jacob generation have a, has a repentant heart. And that's what I was talking about earlier on. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. What is your name? My name is Jacob. Which means what? Well, Jacob means trickster, deceiver, supplanter. That's my name. So Jacob was confessing. His past had caught up to him. And he concluded that only his God can deliver him and change his life and his situation. Be a person quick to repent. Hallelujah. We need to be a people that is quick to repent. Jacob acknowledged who he was. He recognized his sin, but he was in a state of repentance, seeking the face of God, seeking the blessing of God, seeking his presence, seeking his approval, acknowledging his weakness, but running after God regardless hallelujah number five a jacob generation have their identity hid in christ they have their identity hid in christ look at what god says to him in verse 28 he said your name shall no longer be called jacob by is but israel for you have struggled with god and with men and have prevailed praise god a jacob generation never gives up and as a result their identities are molded. They're changed to become more like Jesus. You see, there's, there's something that happens when you go through life and challenges, but yet you remain on your knees in prayer. Yet you, you keep running after Him. Over time, He molds you. He matures you. You become sanctified. Hallelujah. Why is identity so important? Because your identity determines your destiny. Your identity determines how you act, what you speak, what you say, what you do. Hallelujah. Israel was birthed because Jacob prevailed. Jacob, a Jacob generation births souls, which really speaks about doing the ministry. A Jacob generation will do the work. They get the work done. They're not afraid to get their, their hands dirty. What are you birthing? What are you giving life to? Well, in John 7, 38, Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. <laughs> Hallelujah. Living waters flow from a heart of faith. A heart of faith gives birth to life. Israel was birthed because Jacob prevailed. A Jacob generation will be the cause for the birth of revival where people all over the world will come to know Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. A Jacob generation will intercede for the nations and will call them in from the north, from the south, the east and the west. And number six, praise God, a Jacob generation will experience the blessing in their lives. They'll experience the blessing. Verse 29, then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. God blessed him there. You see, there is a blessing in your battle. There is a blessing in your struggle. Don't miss the blessing in your battles. A Jacob generation will see the blessing and walk in the blessing of God for their lives. In other words, they will experience the blessing of God. The blessing of God was upon Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob and his descendants. Hallelujah. Matthew 19 verse 29. Jesus says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Praise God. You see, there's a blessing in following Jesus. So who is a Jacob generation? Well, number one, a Jacob generation is a people that seek God more than anything else. Number two, a Jacob generation is a people who have an encounter with the living God. Number three, a Jacob generation is one who seeks the Lord no matter the cost. Number four, a Jacob generation has a repentant heart. Number five, a Jacob generation have their identity hid in Christ. Number six, a Jacob generation will experience the blessing in their lives. Will you be? A Jacob generation. Hallelujah. Well, church, I pray that you've been blessed by this word. I know I've been blessed. Um, and before we go, I'd love to pray for your needs right now. So won't you put your faith with mine? Let's trust God for a miracle. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we cover each and every person. Yeah, today, each and every person on this call, I pray the blood of Jesus over them. I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will touch each person, whether they are sick in their bodies. We come against every sickness, every disease in Jesus' name. And we declare them whole, healed, and delivered. Father, we pray over financial needs. Lord, I ask that you help lead them, guide them, give them wisdom to make the right financial decisions. Lord, that you will also provide supernaturally and that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. Lord, we pray for marriages and families. Yeah. We pray for unity in every home. We pray that where there is um, arguing and disputes and strife, Lord, we bind that in the name of Jesus and we declare that your peace will fill every home, every relationship, that there will be reconciliation and unity in every home and family represented yeah, and that Jesus will be revealed in every heart and home in Jesus name. Father, I speak a blessing over your people. We thank you that we can be a Jacob generation, a generation that will that will get things done, a generation that will preach the gospel, a generation that won't give up, a generation that is hungry and desperate for the living God. We thank you that we are a Jacob generation in Jesus name. Amen. Praise God, church. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you on the weekend and I'll catch you next week. Bye-bye for now.